Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going indeed to introduce you in the magnificent world of the water fleas and the parasites. They are very small organisms, but you can find them everywhere if you look well enough. Um, I will tell you more about their adaptation, how one adapts to the other and the other way around, and then I will try to explain you how we can come to the story of Alice in Wonderland and Red Queen dynamics. But if I'm talking about adaptations, I have to talk about the person that you have met probably last year, but we should not forget about, that is Darwin. I insist that um, referring at him again because he is really the person who learned us that adaptation and natural selection is the basis of evolution. And he came to that concept after his big voyage of a, uh, with the ship, the Beagle, around the world. So there he met different populations and he came into the end that adaptation and natural selection are important processes. In his book of the origin of species, he learned us that a lot of species actually have the potential to populate the whole world if they would want to. But on the other hand, he also noticed that population stayed relatively constant. So that led him to conclude that every organism is in a struggle of life and it's only the best adapted at a certain circumstance that will win and pass on his uh, own genes. That's the survival of the fittest. So everyone is on this world born to, born to maximize its fitness and to produce its genes to the next generation. Darwin came to that um, idea after his uh, traveling around the world and one example to clearly show you how evolution and natural selection work is the example of the giant tortoises at the Galapagos Islands. So um, the Galapagos Islands are relatively new, so geologically seen they are new. So what has happened probably and what is most uh, likely is that one female pregnant tortoise came on the Galapagos Islands and she let a lot of uh, uh, offspring that spread it around all the different um, islands of the Galapagos. Now, each island on the Galapagos differs in the circumstances that there are. You have dry islands and you have more wetter islands. So the dry islands, they typically have high foliages with um, high-growing plants. Um, so this led to the diversification of a few tortoises. So we have typically the saddle type with a long neck, and then the doom type with a short neck, and the intermediate type. So now all you may think, oh, now she's going to explain the story of the giraffes of Lamarck. No, I'm not. I'm going to show you how uh, Darwin clearly differs from Lamarck. What Lamarck says was that we all inherit acquired traits and we give it to our offspring, but that's individual-based. That's a big difference with Darwin. Darwin's natural selection theory is based on populations, so on whole groups, on all of you. So what actually happened with these tortoises is that at a certain island, they come, they adapt, and the best adapted um, individuals will pass on their genes to the next generations. So in a dry island with high foliage, the, those with long necks will have a higher reproductive capacity and they will have more offspring. So the next time, the next generation that you look, the percentage of long necks has changed, it has increased. So these are the frequency changes that we see in allelic variance over time in natural selection. Now I have to tell you a small story about Lonesome George. Lonesome George is one of the tortoises that is the last descendant of the Pinta Island on the Galapagos. So what happened, uh, the people came on Galapagos, they reduced the total population, and in the 60s, 70s, the last individual that was found was Lonesome George. It's also called the rarest living creature. And this is because he was totally alone. And there was not so much hope for Lonesome George, actually, because when they found him, they kept him in captivity and they placed him with other tortoises of, uh, of the island nearby, of Isabella Island. And um, he was totally not interested in these female tortoises. So it was very pity. So they always thought, okay, Lonesome George, George will stay alone. But apparently recently there is a lot of, there is more hope for Lonesome George because he showed to attend some mating activities of, uh, with his female partners. And also they found a new individual which is actually a hybrid, so a cross between the species of Lonesome George and another one of Isabella. So there is hope for conservation biology that they may have new Lonesome George in the end after a while. 
Um, but having said that, I actually, until now, I mainly focused, and if we think about evolution, we think about macroevolution. We think about the diversification of species, but I'm going to prove and tell to you that evolution is going much more faster than we think, and it's all also around us. Um, so, this is the normal macroevolution. I will go a bit faster. We go to shorter time scales. And then another example is the Darwin finches, which may be familiar to you as well. But what you see here is that the Darwin finches, you have different species. They all look pretty similar, but if you look very well, you see that they differ in the, in the beak size, so in the type of the beak. So, that's actually a way of reducing competition. So, all company people who are here, an important lesson of the Darwin Finch's way we may learn is try to diversify as much as possible. You have to find the niche the other one didn't find. This is why we have to come up with innovative ideas. And this is what the Darwin Finch's also did. So they each became specialized in the type of food that they ate. So we had uh, an evolution towards different species. And Peter and Rosemary Grant, they could show after a few years that they studied the Darwin finches um, at the uh, Galapagos Islands, that this evolution can go fast. What you see on the slide here uh, on the left, you see that um, in 1976, some of you may remember, although you all look pretty young, but we have a very dry year. So what have happened, has happened is that uh, there was not much food. There was only big, seeded, uh, big seeds, so we actually got a shift in the big size from small size to the big, uh, 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 larger size. And importantly, um, they could also show that this has a genetic basis. So here we see evolution. We see genetic changes over time in a few traits. That is adaptation. And they also calculated that if those drought periods would happen a few times, we will become with new species every 20 years. So that's already pretty fast. But not so fast as evolution with parasites, and more particularly co-evolution, because co-evolution refers to the evolution that two species exert on each other because they adapt to each other, and they then may diversify. Parasites or pathogens, so we all know uh, the viruses and the bacteria who are uh, becoming very virulent and resistant, they typically adapt very, very fast. Um, another example of striking behavior in coevolution, and uh, to show you a bit how coevolution can end, is with this worm, this Dicrochelium dendriticum. This worm actually um, induces changes in behavior of ants. So you see the ant over there. Um, what this worm typically does is going to different species. So it has multiple hosts. It goes from the ant to the sheep, and after the sheep to the snail, and then again to the ant. So, uh, all the time. So what this worm can do is from the moment it comes into the ant, it will migrate to the brain of the ant, or how you uh, need to call it, so the um, the ganglia um, of the ant, or actually it um, sticks to that. Then what happens is that the ant is growing on the grass, on top of the grass, and it freezes until a sheep comes, because then it gets eaten faster. So that's a very smart behavior change of this parasite, because it also does it every day and on very strict time points. And these time points are related to the sheep predation activity. So this shows that these um, adaptations can go very um, peculiar and that they are very strong. But then to our very fast adapting parasites, and the most fast ones are the viruses and the bacteria. So what you see on the slide in here is that if there is no selection, we get multiple strains. So we all differ, we all are different types. But from the moment that we exert selection, and that's what has happened, for instance, with the Staphylococcus aureus, maybe more familiar to you as the Ziekenhuis bacteria. So what has happened is that if you have selection, so as if you use current antibiotics such as methicillin, you will only have a few lines that can survive the antibiotics and they will become very resistant. So persons in hospitals have a high, sh high chance to become more exposed to those most resistant mutated bacterial lines if you have used a lot of um, antibiotics. Um, and then um, I almost come to my 
uh, research, but I what I want to stress here is that given that we have these very fast adaptations between host and parasites, we can actually have a co-evolutionary arms race. With this, with this I mean that there is no absolute goal, so they actually um, fight off each other all the time, and with only that thing in mind is that they want to be relatively better than the other one. Referring to the Cold War between the USSR and the states, and maybe also our Belgian government, it tends to show some co-evolutionary arms races as well, if you ask me. Um, so, a solution for that, maybe the people in the government should listen. Um, in this arms race with this um, host and parasites, we can have red queen dynamics. What are those red queen dynamics now? Uh, first of all, the main principle is actually that you have to use as much different possibilities to fight off your parasites as possible. So, um, using antibiotic cocktails seem to be very efficient because it lowers the resistance adaptation of the parasites. And another solution that nature has found is sexual recombination because apparently there are lots of costs to sexual reprodu reproduction for one person more than for the other. But the good thing is that you have genetically diversified offspring and having this, all these different types makes it more difficult for the parasite to adapt. You can see that on the left graph, if you have an asexual population, so assume worms that are produced all the time asexually, then the parasites will in, win easily. But if you have an organism that can reproduce sexually, it's much more difficult for the parasite. And this adaptation actually re, uh, leads to this red queen dynamics. You don't have to understand this graph, but what you do have to understand is that you see that they fluctuate all the time. So we get fluctuations in allelic frequencies over time, if you want to say it more difficult. So we get all this fluctuation, and the result is that no one wins. No one will get to the directional fixed point. Or you can also say um, the net effect on the fitness or on, of their genetic contribution changes only relatively, and who stands still loses the game, clearly. And this is why it's called the Red Queen, because it's referring to the story of Alice in Wonderland, where the Red Queen is saying to Alice, now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. So we have to be faster than these bacterial lines. Okay, we knew all that, so we were busy with that. During my PhD, I was developing those ideas, and then I said, oh, that's a pity. We don't have real evidence for the process. We see that bacterial lines mutate, and that there is some adaptation, but it's very difficult to follow those lines over time. So then we came up with um, our system, and which is our Daphnia, and the nice things with our water fleas, so actually they are very small, they are not fleas, they do not fly around, they are, or they do not jump around, they jump in the water, so they are actually small shrimps. And what they can do is combining our asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. So if everything goes good, if there's enough food, they will reproduce asexual, so they are clonals, we have different clones. But if things go bad, they start to produce males, and also haploid eggs, and then you have this resting egg, which goes to the bottom of a lake. So very interestingly, Daphnia only need the males in bad situations. <laughs> so what they then do, the result is that um, if you have these resting eggs, they actually have new layers every year. So if you then take a sediment core out of your lake and you slice it in different depths, you can take the resting eggs out and we can also hatch them so we can actually revive the Daphnia. This means we can go back into time. So we, can, um, ha we have actually a unique possibility to reconstruct the genetic structure and evolutionary changes from the past. So what did I do? I went to a nice pond in Heverly near Brussels, Leuven, and I took some um, uh, sediment cores in which there was a population of water fleas. On the right, you see a sick water flea, a sick Daphnia. It's full of those bacterial spores, and they typically kill the eggs of the Daphnia. So you see the sick one in red doesn't have eggs, and the healthy one does ha has. This is it's a very strong competition because killing of your, um, your eggs means that you don't have genetic contribution to the next generation. So we have a hard competition between our water flea and our parasite. 
So we took sediment cores, we sliced them into cresting eggs, we revived Daphnia, and we also took the pyrazite spores out of the different depths. So in this way, we could go um, back into time and actually reconstruct evol co-evolution in the past because we had an archive of our host and we had an archive of our parasite, so we could look what hap has happened in the time. And this is how we reconstructed co-evolution. We then took the Daphnia of the different depths and we exposed them in the lab to the parasites from the layer below. So these are the parasites from the past, the same layer, the contemporary parasites we call them, and then the parasites from the layer above. These are the parasites of the future. And if everything goes well, we should have a short intermezzo of a movie now. But I don't know if it's coming. Parasit gegen Wirt. Forscher der Universität Löwen wollen die Kontrahenten genauer untersuchen. Beide leben im Wasser. Da ist zum einen der Wirt, ein Wasserfloh. Und zum anderen noch viel kleiner der Parasit, ein Bakterium. Das Bakterium befällt den Wasserfloh und macht ihn unfruchtbar. Das Besondere Beide bilden Eier bzw. eine Art Kapseln, die auf den Seeboden sinken und dort im Schlick Jahrzehnte überdauern können. Auf diese Dauerstadien haben es die Forscher abgesehen. Sie bohren tief in den Schlick und bringen einen Querschnitt des Seebodens nach oben. Diesen Bohrkern schneiden sie in verschiedene Schichten. Je tiefer die Schicht, umso älter ist sie. Die unterste Schicht stammt aus den 1970er Jahren. In der Zeitrechnung der Wasserflöhe sind seitdem 400 Generationen vergangen. Jede einzelne Schlickschicht steht dabei für einen Zeitraum von rund fünf Jahren. In jeder Schlickschicht finden die Forscher Eier der Wasserflöhe. Je nachdem, aus welcher Tiefe die Schicht kommt, stammen die Eier aus den 1970er Jahren, aus den 80ern, 90ern oder von heute. Und obwohl die Eier zum Teil jahrzehntelang im Schlick begraben waren, schlüpfen aus ihnen wieder Wasserflöhe, sobald die richtigen Bedingungen herrschen. Die Forscher können quasi die Tiere, die in der Vergangenheit gelebt haben, wieder auferstehen lassen. Auf diese Weise entsteht eine komplette Zeitreihe von Wasserflöhen, von den 1970er Jahren bis heute. In den so this was a short intermezzo and I, it was in German. My apologies for that, but I think you understood. So what it showed was actually that you, you have the resting eggs, they go to the bottom and you can revive them again. And so we can reconstruct a co-evolution from the past. So in these different slices, we took the host and the parasite and then we looked what happens. So this is what I said before. Um, but interestingly, our results show that there is indeed an arms race going on, so a red-green arms race, because we see on the graph, you clearly see that on average, the current or the contemporary association, so if you take the parasite and the host from the same depth, that the parasites do best. They infect better the Daphnia than parasites from the dead below, so post-parasites are parasites of the future. And then if we look over the whole range, we saw that there is no directional increase in infectivity over time. So this shows that no one wins. You get this continuous adaptation between the host and the parasite, resulting in an, uh, no final or absolute goal. So we had an empirical evidence for host parasite red queen dynamics, um, and I hope I, can con uh, I could convince you that even by using such a small uh, animal as the water, fly water flea, that we can see important um, evolutionary processes going on. And they are important not only for the Daphnia, but what we then did is putting our results in models, and we can extrapolate our results to other models, such as the human immune system. And there we can also see that um, there's a lot of genetic variation on resistance loci in the humans. This is coming proof more and more now. And apparently we also find a key role in evolution of biodiversity, um, and this comes to the biodiversity year then, um, because the fact that sexual reproduction is important, you ha we have to create genetic variation, we have to create diversification, and in this way we will be able to conserve our biodiversity, maybe.
Thank you for your attention.